So first off, I'll say that um, I felt like this was one of the shortest chapters, but for me, it was one of the most confusing. Um, and the reason for that is, is profile data, which I did not know what that was when I signed up for this chapter. Um, but I have worked with something similar. And profile data um, essentially is a data set that has a very complex structure that is normally um, hierarchical, you know, sort of like a tree. It made me think of um, in graduate school when I worked with data from the Internal Revenue Service and all of their data is in XML format. Um, normally like sometimes six, seven different levels deep that like change multiple times throughout the year. And it was a huge mess. So I kind of had flashbacks from that um, experience. I'll also say that um, profile data reminded me of the movie Inception, where the movie is about um, being able to go into dreams and you can go um, multiple dreams deep. Um, so with a dream within a dream, and then sometimes like you can see in the GIF right there, the dreams are kind of all kind of mixing together and you can't really tell what is up and what is down. Um, that's sort of uh, profile data in a nutshell. <laughs> um, so the main learning objectives for this chapter were to be able to process profile data, um, to be able to select appropriate models, to make adequate predictions. All right, and um, I'm just gonna move this around a little bit. Uh, this chapter was essentially one case study. And you can read this here, this is straight from the book. But basically it was taking data from a pharmaceutical company that was trying to produce a biological drug. And they're interested in these specific, very special, proteins and they create these proteins by um, putting cells in a bioreactor and the protein is essentially the yield of that reactor and things that increase the yield are you know food temperature those things are recorded as well as cellular data, such as glucose and the production of ammonia, which actually decreases the yield. Um, let's go down to the little image here. The one thing about that though, is that measuring glucose and ammonia is extremely time consuming and expensive. So they don't do that. <laughs> what they do um, is use spectroscopy say that three times, spectroscopy measurements um, on each of the reactors. And so there are 15 small reactors in blue, um, and they're trying to make predictions about the three large reactors in yellow. So I imagine like these large reactors are what they would use in the industrial setting, but in order to help develop their model, they use these smaller ones because it's cheaper. So this is kind of the schematic of the design. So you've got small reactors, and then one level below that is um, you're taking measurements every single day from each reactor, and the measurements from each day are these um, these curves of of wavelengths. And I'm actually going to go down into the definitions. This was really important for me to go over because I had no idea what spectroscopy was. And they use these terms that are very kind of jargony and specific to, to this specific field that I have not worked in before. But just to kind of like overview for comprehension purposes, um, spectroscopy is a field of study that measures and interprets electromagnetic um, spectra. And that has to do with um, electromagnetic radiation, kind of energy wavelengths. Um, they use the word spectra and spectrum a lot, and that's kind of what we're measuring. And that's like a band of colors um, expressed in wavelengths. And um, the intensity is um, usually on the y-axis, and the intensity refers to the energy within those wavelengths. 
And so one thing we see right off the bat, so this plot right here um, is looking at, I believe just one small reactor and looking at the wave number on the x-axis, the intensity, the energy on the y-axis, and each line is a different day. Oh, sorry. So we have a small reactor here and then large reactor on the right. Making comparisons between the two of them, we see that the intensity is much lower on day one, which kind of makes sense. Um, and subsequently, they get much higher. And there are some similarities between the small and large reactors. Um, namely, the peaks in the graph look very similar, right? You have this peak right here, and it kind of mirrors this large reactor. However, um, you can see that the intensities for the large reactor look much greater, and kind of the variation between them looks greater as well. And then um, towards the higher wavelengths, it seems day one um, does not mirror the small reactor as well. And here's just another representation of just one reactor to show you how the intensity is supposed to increase um, over the number of days. So the blue is the last day, which I believe they, they capture the data over 14 days for each reactor. Actually, no, I think that's what they use for the lag, but I could be wrong. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get back to the lag in a second. Um, any questions about the data or any of the graphs so far? Okay, all good. Hopefully no one had as much problem as I did. <laughs> um, one thing that they repeat over and over in this chapter is that when working with profile data, it's really important to understand what your experimental unit is, what your um, unit of analysis is for um, your prediction, right? Because in this data set, you could um, predict, try and predict the intensity um, on a specific day, for example. But that's not good because um, all of the wavelengths within a reactor are going to be correlated with each other. And so this will lead to biased results. Um, and for that reason, each bioreactor, so the bioreactor is the unit of analysis. And um, you can see here, here's an, uh, kind of an explanation about the autocorrelation that are, exists within one bioreactor. So um, kind of difficult to explain, but um, in this plot, we can see autocorrelation between wavelengths on different days. So we can see, and, and the x-axis is the lag, y is the correlation. So we can see um, with few lags, it's almost like, you know, correlation of 0.95, you know, super, super, super high. Um, and it really doesn't decrease to zero, at least for day one until lag, I don't know, 300. It goes much further for days seven and 14. This is just another um, representation of that. Let's see. Um, okay. I'm just reading through my notes here. But yeah, just, just to reiterate, this tells us that we should not be using um, the wave numbers as our unit of analysis because of all the correlation. And a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is how can we pre-process the data to get rid of noise and also to get rid of that correlation within our bioreactors. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do, and there's like, uh, I think six different steps that they suggest. But um, the first step to reduce that background noise, um, they use a polynomial fit. And I should back up and say that, um, you know, this is like specific to spectroscopy data, but um, the intensity deviation, so the, the deviations in the energy 
from zero are, are called the, the baseline drift. And this like deviation is normally due to things, um, you know, outside of the control of the researcher. And that could be noise from the measurement instrument. So like maybe um, one bioreactor's temperature sensor like is always like 0.5 degrees higher than another bioreactor, for example. Or let's say um, maybe a separate light source is interfering with the um, spectroscopy measurement. So like the, the, the images that um, that are taken of the cells uh, are interfered with. So maybe one bioreactor, it looks like is always more intense than the others, for example. They also say fluorescence, but I'm not really sure what that means. Maybe that's just another way that um, another energy source having to do with light could interfere with the measurements. And so um, this is just, I think this is just one bioreactor, this plot right here. So the, here's the original um, measurement for wavelength and intensity. And you see how it kind of has occasionally these like jagged um, changes. And then sometimes it's very smooth. And in order to pull out those, um, the baseline drift, um, they fit a polyno, uh, they do a polynomial fit on the lowest, so the most negative residuals. And so that's what you see right here in the middle. And then they subtract that out from the original measurements. And you get this, this corrected um, curve here, which looks like it has more descriptive information perhaps. All right. Um, the next couple steps have to do with taking out more systemic variation between the bio um, reactor measurement instruments. And so, like I showed on maybe the first or second page, there is a, a difference between the small reactors and the large reactors in that for some whatever reason, on average, the large reactors look like they're more intense than the small ones. And you know that might not necessarily be the case. That could probably be that um, there is some noise with the measurement instruments, for example. I think that's what this one is about. Let me just read. OK, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this was about. Oh, no, this is about the variation within um, the wavelengths itself within one reactor. They do something else later to, to um, kind of fix the difference between the small and the large reactors, but this is kind of like a similar concept. You see that um, from, there's two different, I guess, like intensities for high and low variation. So you see the this difference right here. And they do a process of, standardization to make sure um, that the variation between those two tracks remains relatively the same. So we've got um, baseline correction, now standardization. Um, another source of noise in, the, in this particular data set was the intensity measurements for each wavelength. So like measuring the energy that comes off of every single wavelength. Um, and they do that by, by introducing a moving averages along with splines to kind of smooth out this curve. One thing they talk a lot about a lot about is um, selecting the right number of points to create the lag. And so this first one on the left, you see that um, a lot of the jagged, uh, the jaggedness of the plot remains. So we probably don't want to do this one. 
This middle one seems to be a great mix of, of, of smoothing while also maintaining the shape of the curve. Whereas the last one where it's a lag of, I guess, um, 50 wavelengths, you kind of don't get those peaks and valleys as well as you should. Just zooming through this, took a lot longer to put this together. <laughs> Just because I had to try my best to understand everything. So if I totally got an explanation wrong, I will not be offended at all. Um, I would appreciate that. Um, okay, so there's two, I believe there's two more things that they do in terms of pre-processing before we go on to the model selection. And one of the, like, I think the second to last thing is removing the, or trying to get rid of the correlation. And the two methods they recommend for that um, are like PCA uh, and partial least squares. And you can see right here that actually with very few components, we can get a, a large amount of variation right away. And PCA kind of, just because of the way it's constructed, gets rid of the correlation between your features. Um, but we see here in B that even though it gets rid of the correlation, PCA by itself does not improve the predictive power of our model. So we probably don't want to do that, which I'm not sure why they showed us this if it wasn't a great um, method to use. And it looks like I accidentally posted these twice, but um, sorry for that. Yeah, so I'm not really sure why they showed us that one if it was so bad. They should have just showed us the partially squares, I think. Um, another approach that they use in the end to get rid of the correlation is um, to use the first order derivative, um, to take the first order derivative with each profile to compute um, the first order differentiation. And this is like mostly I pulled right from the book. So they take the response um, at this point and then subtract it from, from each response in the profile. And this um, essentially reduces the autocorrelation. So you see here, um, the blue line just, just contains the smooth step in the pre-processing. And you see that the correlation is, is really high and it has this like gradual decline as you increase the lags. Um, but you still need about, you know, almost 200 lags to get rid of that correlation. Whereas when you take the first order derivative, it declines more precipitously. And then so altogether with all these steps, um, you could almost entirely eliminate the within spectra drift from the baseline um, while also keeping those vital peaks which contain the, the, the predictive information. So we've got day one, day seven, day 14 um, of measurements that were taken. Here you have zero pre-processing. Here you have removing the baseline, standardization, smoothing and then finally taking the first order derivative and you have this really nice um you know time series curve well it looks like time series it's not it's this the wave number all right <clears throat> lastly the the last chapter is about model selection and cross validation which understanding your experimental unit is really important for this because if you use um, K-fold or leave one out um, cross validation on just the days, you're gonna get um, you know autocorrelation. So you might get overly optimistic um, predictions. And because it's so small, the data set is so small in this case, like only 15 um, bioreactors for essentially the train. And they recommend doing leave one out or doing K-fold cross-validation repeated multiple times, just so that um, you don't have one split 
that is unusual by senior results. So here's just like an example of the, the, the folds that would be used in k-fold cross-validation. In terms of model selection, um, there are essentially four that they mention. Um, the first two, PCA and, and PLS, are often used because of their ability to get rid of the correlation, right? But these only work um, if the relationship between the predictors and the response is linear or planar. Um, it's not going to be good if you have a lot of nonlinear trends. So for nonlinear trends, they recommend neural networks, support vector machines, or tree-based methods. It should also be noted that um, neural networks and SVMs um, are going to need a lot of pre-processing steps, whereas the tree method will not. However, the tree methods have one disadvantage in that the variable importance measures at the end are going to be a little bit deceiving because it doesn't take out um, the correlation. And then let one of the last plots kind of describes how different models are affected by the pre-processing steps. One thing I will say is that Cubist, I believe it's a Cubist support vector machine. I'm pretty sure what that, that's what that is. And then SVM is just like your typical SVM. And so you can see right off the bat that um, Cubist SVM and PLS do the best and that as we go further down the funnel and pre-processing steps that they generally do lower the RNSC. Um, with, with Cubis and PLS, they already start pretty low, but at the end, PLS seems to be the best. Um, SVM does really well once you get to the first order derivatives. But like I said earlier, for, for neural nets and, and um, SVM, you're gonna have to ensure you do a lot of pre-processing. Um, let's see. This last graph looks even closer into PLS. So one of the things that's um, not, not as informative as this plot, you see that PLS is the lowest um, right here in blue, but it doesn't tell you um, anything about the components that are used. But this plot shows you, um, you know, each pre-processing step and the number of components that you're using. And once you get to the derivatives, you only really need um, four components to get a good measurement. Whereas all of the other um, PLS models with differing pre-processing steps, you need to almost have like 10 steps. So it's twice as good if you go all the way to the first derivative. All right. Oh man, I guess there's one more, two more, two more plots. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, man, let's see here. What do I have to say about these? So this plot right here, it's just a comparison between the observed and the predicted glucose values for the large scale data. So this is after we've trained, um, after we've done pre-processing, we're testing it out on the big reactors. Um, and we see with no processing, we're still pretty far off with um, the earliest days being furthest from, from the trend line. And then all the way to the derivatives, and it's comparing Cubis, SEM to PLS, we have per, the best fit, but these, these first few days are still furthest from the line. So we need to be careful when interpreting those first um, couple days. And then this last, last plot, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> is trying to explain the importance of using the bioreactor as, as the unit of analysis because this plot uses just the days, I believe. 
it uses, I believe it uses just the days and it's comparing, if you use leave one out with just the days, you're always going to be kind of far off from, from the actual, um, like the actual RMSE. So I believe it's comparing the RMSE between leave one out and naive resampling, which I guess would be a better method in this case. It was a little unclear. They didn't explain this, this graph very, very well, I don't think. But each, each of these points represents um, both the model that was used and the different processing step um, that it was on. So that would be the color. And you see here, right, that uh, you know PLS still does the best at, when you go all the way to the derivatives, whereas the neural nets and SVM are kind of up here at the top. All right, and that's all, folks. <laughs> uh, the big takeaways from this is that profile data is very complicated. You have to worry about highly correlated features and whether you can understand what you're looking at. <laughs> um, and you need to make sure you understand what the experimental unit is because that will guide your decisions in terms of pre-processing and the evaluation of your model. Ultimately, though, I think for this type of data structure, you really need to have some expert domain knowledge to really know what is most important, right? Because I probably spent like half my time just like researching on what all these different things meant. <laughs> and I'm glad I don't have to work on, on this type of data. Anyways, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good presentation. Thanks, uh, thanks. I just posted in the yeah. chat, uh, you know, some of the concepts that Ethan brought to us in terms of the time series uh, autocorrelation, which is something that is pertaining to time series, uh, different from the ordinary regression. You know, the ordinary regression, one of the assumptions is that those points in the regression should be independent. When in the time series, you break that assumption. And for good reason, because you want to know if past points have a correlation with your future, you know, your future uh, forecast, uh, future points. So in the chat, there's a good, uh, I found a good uh, uh, definition of what is autocorrelation, which is, you know, something that you should be aware of when you're working with time series. If you work with, you know, similar data with no, uh, you know, time component, then correlation, the correlation that we that we know, uh, you know, should be handled in the same, you know, in, in the same pattern. But in time series, correlation is something that you should be aware. So that's something that uh, in this chapter is kind of, uh, you know, essential <laughs> to yeah to the, yeah for sure. I wish yeah, and definitely, and definitely, uh, the, the domain knowledge is critical here. Okay, yeah, yeah. we're talking about chemical reactions, about spectrometry, etc. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to go. I almost wish they would have done some more like financial, like data set or something, just so that it would be more a little comprehensible. I think, but right, very, very, very good points. Well, you know, the the the, the authors. I know that uh, Max Kuhn. You know he worked in the in the pharmaceutical business, so yeah, he brings that he brings that expertise. So probably yeah. somebody else was in the financial that he will bring. You know the financial stuff, right? <laughs> I figured that's what that happened because I was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> somebody who got their PhD in this probably oh, yeah. chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's all I have. Um, Federica, are, are we all set for next week? Yeah, hello? Hello. Okay, uh, just my connection gone for a few seconds. So yes, um, just, to, just a little addition, uh, so just to, uh, uh, identify the um, uh, profile data within your data. 
uh, and uh, as a definition, like the profile data are the, uh, the baseline, um, the building blocks of your of the phenomenon that you are analyzing. So, like if you if you see something that is repeating regularly, uh, those uh, predictors that helps uh, this uh, repeating um, um, behavior uh, within time will be identified as a profiling uh, elements of your data. So, for example, if we have, uh, let, 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 they did um, a little example um, about students. Yes. In STEM or something like that. So, students uh, under some conditions uh, have uh, um, some outcomes that verifies and repeats. It, those conditions verify again within within your data within uh, the uh, so the spectrum that you are analyzing. So those are the uh, those are profiling your data in some senses. So you um, so basically it's a way to say that uh, when you um, identify the response variable and the predictors you should identify as predictors it's always a, a matter of selecting predictors um, how to work with uh, with predictors to uh, better identify the response and everything you know? so you you might want to um, identify select those predictors that are characterizing your phenomenon better than uh the others so they are the building blocks of the, of the phenomenon that you are analyzing and um, that's why uh, um, so the comparison within uh, uh, like a little um in in the case of the reactor so you it's enough for you to understand how a little reactor works because when you have a repetition inside of this little reactor inside a, 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 a larger reactor the behavior is the same it's just as the same so you, you can focus your attention on the on the on the little one and uh, make some statistics so you you work out uh, on your data like making uh, averages standard deviations variance and everything and those are the way to to work around your profiling data that you then uh, like um, project on a larger environment. And uh, th this is quite, so for, for, for data which are quite complex, uh, it's not an easy task, but uh, uh, if, if, you, if we think about the students uh, in, at school and how they, um, um, do well no. under some conditions. So you like the the age uh, and the, some 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 topics which are uh, easier uh, compared to the others, and uh, even uh, the season. And so so the, the um, those things that are repeating uh, and structuring your your the phenomenon that you are analyze basically and then they they do this um uh, moving averages or polynomials and you are working with your profiling data engineering them and then you apply this this uh, um, transformations to your data. the same thing but just defines uh that the building blocks are profiling your data so if you if you're able to identify them because some condition is quite hard and difficult to identify the which are they effectively 
and there's a, a little very uh, the, the 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 final the final bit uh, um, two two more things. Um, I like the things that there is uh, this scree plot, which uh, um, that 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 uh, like like a rock curve. It seems like shaping a, that, but it's called a scree plot, and that that's that's nice. Um, so I've discovered uh, at least two uh, plots that I didn't know anything about <laughs> uh, <laughs> within these chapters, and uh, this is the second one and with the geom contour, the contour plot, which is a quite challenging thing. And then I like it, the, the, the last paragraph within the summary, which, uh, which states uh, uh, that um, the, the things that I have attempted to, to to repeat, uh, I don't know how much properly, but uh, it says that uh, the type of data can occur if a sample is measured repeatedly over time. So these are the profiling your data. So, yeah. Yeah. It almost, almost makes you think of like, like putting putting the data each in its own like filing cabinet like, and those filing cabinets are the building blocks for your final thing you're trying to predict i thought the 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 student example is also really good too because you know let's say you're trying to predict what a student's grade is going to be on a class and you have classes they've taken previously but maybe some students took a different stats 101 professor so how are you going to process that data to make a prediction where, you know, maybe Professor A is really hard on students and gives them all C's, whereas another, another teacher is really easy, right? So you're going to have to feature engineer all of that to make it comprehensible. Oh, quite, 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 quite interesting um, uh, chapter. And um, basically, we end with this chapter, the uh, an important part of the book. And if you, if we don't have any other additions, maybe or comments or things about uh, this chapter. Um, the the next uh, the, the next section would be um, feature selection and um, the, the the i will i will be uh, talking about the chapter 10 next week and uh, it's a short chapter uh, just an introduction so repeating of things that we already done just to wrap up uh, the things I introduce the the following two chapters, which are concluding they they they, they concluding the uh, the book, and um, uh, I think that, that would be very important to uh, like have an idea, <laughs> uh, so draw like some lines about how to feature engineering uh, your data for uh, appropriately make a model. Sounds good. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. So I think it's a very intense book. Any, any, so all the, or any, any paragraph, anything, it says many things. Even if sometimes it's, it's look like it's they are repeating, but it adds uh, information, and um, uh, it's just talking. It's not uh, that you have code to look at. You, you you might want to have a look at the code aside, but you don't have code, so you have fitted lines, and it tells a lot about the things. So, ah, yeah.
Yeah, I think I've gotten a lot out of each chapter. You're right. There's just like, it's very dense information, but all of it is really good, honestly. Yeah, I'm saying this because um, I did it quite a, a, a bit, appropriately, at least my chapters, you know, because then, then when, you know, you do your chapter, I then just get a bit relaxed. And I, I, I don't do that very, uh, you know, in, in depth as, as, I, as if it was my chapter. Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, uh, I've got the book, but uh, if, to, to really understand it, I, I will need to do that again. In case. That would be a first read. A first read is not enough. One mm -hmm. read is not enough. Oh yeah, I think I've read every chapter twice for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, as, and, and sometimes, you know, from another book club, then you go back. For example, I have gone back to the you know, introduction to statistical learning. Oh, okay, nice. because you know maybe there was some something that I didn't understand at first, but then reading about other reference, then I said, oh, wait a minute, let me go back, you know, to check, you know, if this, you know, ties with that. And then I get more understanding. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a natural process. You know, every time you read a book, the first time, you know, you're going to get everything. <laughs> yeah, that's almost impossible. But then over time, then you acquire other, you know, other, other knowledge, other ideas and then you go back at the, oh now i understand you know what 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 it is talking about and then i can add up you know to that to that part uh that has happened to me in the precisely the, in the discussion of the pca the physical component analysis uh usually in the business especially in the business uh, data science uh world uh pca is not talked that much okay mm -hmm. but since this book Almost every chapter, you know, you get that PCA component, you know, that PCA talk, then, you know, I try to, you know, understand it better. And, you know, usually get more more in depth. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a talk next week on the on, on a meetup that, that I that I organized talking about PCA. Okay, because oh, I know nice. that people will be will be uh, interested in know that hey, there's something here that you could use not for feature selection, but more to understand the relationships between your data, okay? You know, in, instead of, you know, because usually PCA is used to, you know, dimensional reduction, all that, but there's other uses for it. Like for example, the, the miss, missing data. Also uh, detecting outliers too, PCA could, could, be, could be useful for that. Okay, and also there's some caveats. Remember that PCA as, assumes that your data is linearly uh, correlated. So if it's not really correlated, then you have to use other, you know, other stuff. So it, it goes both ways. If you understand what are the relationship and the assumptions of that method, and that's very useful it, it, either way. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of extensions to PCA too. Like one thing right. that I worked with before in grad school was factor analysis, which is similar to PCA. Right. It gives you the direction of each variable contained. The vectors, yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That, that was really cool. And then I haven't used partially squares at all, but I mean, everything that I've read in this chapter about it is just like mm -hmm. amazing reviews. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, do you share your, can, can, you, can you send an invitation to, uh, for, for this talk? Or do you share? Uh, Hello, I, we missed you there, uh, Federica. Hello, hi. Yes. Do, do you can, can we take part to this talk that you are going to to take? Do you have a? Uh, a yeah, I can send you. I can send you the link for the meetup. Yeah, yeah. The, Every, everyone, everyone can join. Yeah. Uh, great. It's can public. You, <laughs> no private. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Time. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the Orlando machine learning and data science oh, okay. uh, meetup and, you know, one of the, of the core organizers. Yeah. In fact, you know, we have a, a challenge right now that we are trying to, you know, kick off. 
uh, from different, what to choose, but we, we uh, I made a sampling of Kaggle challenges. Okay, we chose three, and then we will try to discuss if we can hone to one of them and try to do all the machine learning process from you know conception through deployment. Okay, so also you, you're invited. Yeah, yeah, and you can join. Maybe we can. Uh, we're, we're trying to get some teams. Okay, so we can have different perspectives. So not, this is a chance to apply while mm -hmm. you're learning in theory. You apply to a you know to a problem. It's a real problem. <laughs> That's the okay. way to learn. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll post it. I'll post the the, the link. Yeah, uh, you, you are uh, uh, welcome. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's have a look uh, at just a, a minute about the uh, how we are. So uh, it's me next week, and then we have uh, uh, greedy search methods on the 28th, then a week off, and then the final chapter, global search methods on the 11th of November. So uh, you, you're free to, to grab a chapter. <laughs> OK. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next week. Okay, have a great weekend, guys. Bye. Bye.